Welcome back to a special edition of Fourth and Forever with an exclusive interview with two women making waves in the sport of football. First up is Santia Deck, current football player on the Los Angeles Flames. Uh, she was also the highest paid and first to sign a big contract in the Women's Football League Association. And second is Dr. Jen Welter, who was a former football player herself and the first female to become an NFL coach in a training camp with the Arizona Cardinals. I hope you enjoy. Time for a special segment on Fourth and Forever. I'm so excited to have this next guest. This person is coming on our show to talk about how she's paving the way for women in the game of football. And she's actually the first female athlete to own a sneaker company, and she's the face of the WFLA. Miss Santia Deck, thank you so much for coming on the show. Of course, thank you for having me. We wanted to first talk about how you actually trained for the Olympics. You're pursuing a professional football career as a female. Let's talk about that journey and how you got to the WFLA and talk about how your trainings helped you. So where did all this start and what was your main influence to, uh, to being attracted to the game of football? So I guess it started from like birth kind of. Uh, I was born into a football family. So all my brothers played football, one of them being my twin. Um, I'm from Houston, Texas. Well, I was raised in Houston, Texas. And of course, Texas is like the football capital, pretty much. Oh, yeah. Um, and so we were just like very much into football always. Um, I never knew I was going to be playing football because I just I didn't have that dream. Um, I really liked to play. Like, I know I did everything my brothers did. So I was in the backyard catching, you know, footballs, running routes, doing everything they were doing. But I always had that. Thing, well, you know, my, my mom didn't want me to actually get out there and get hit. Um, I actually went to a peewee practice one time with my brother and I actually did really good, but I did get well, they hit. they let you play. They let me play. My mom, like, good. forced them. She, my mom forced, <laughs> you know, and they, she let me play, but then I got tackled and she was like, oh, nope, that's it. So that was that was it for me when I was little. Then I, I ran track all my life, so I got a, a full ride to Texas A&M, Kingsville. Um, I tried to actually make the USA team like shortly after college but i got injured so then i was later on introduced to flag football which became like my thing <laughs> i went viral for it you know a few times and different things like that and because of flag football i was actually recruited to play rugby and i started playing rugby i did really really good really really fast i made an international team um and wow. next thing i know i was on the olympic journey i was on the olympic journey for the 2020 olympics um, with like literally less than a year of experience. So all 2019, I was training, um, you know, my body was going through it. I wasn't taking care of it properly, unfortunately. And I did end up getting injured, which kind of ruined my whole journey. And so I went through a small depression for about maybe three months, um, just trying to figure out like what was next for me because I was so used to, you know, doing something and I was very lost mm -hmm. at that time. And I remember getting on my knees one night and just praying to God for him to show me what, what it was I needed to do um, and just how to let go of this Olympic journey because it was devastating. It was traumatizing. You know, literally like two months later, I got a call from the owner. Her name is Lupe Rose. And uh, she offered me something that I could not refuse. And now I'm playing tackle football. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. And I can totally relate. I think a lot of people can, especially athletes, when you get injured like that, and it, you know, changes your daily routine, changes the goals you had set. It is frustrating and it's, yes. a, it's a sad, dark place. I totally get it. I was there with a shoulder injury and I remember thinking like, what am I doing? Am, am I supposed to be playing football? Like, can I still yeah. throw a ball, you know, after surgeries and stuff like that? It's, that's really difficult. So I, exactly. I commend you for that. That's, that's not easy to come back from. I, I still can't wrap my head around track and field. Like, for me, <laughs> running is a means of escape. <laughs> or a punishment okay right. so explain your love for track and field and making a bunch of left turns what's that all about <laughs> the weird thing about my story with track was me and my twin brother we were born premature um we were not expected to live we were the first twins in our family to ever survive but we were very uh muscular we were like abnormally muscular for children um so i remember we were going to the doctor we were getting like our two-year checkup and uh, my mom told me, the doctor was like, yeah, your kids have like the bodies of runners. They have like developed legs yeah. and things like that. So be sure to put them in track when they get old, you know, old enough. And um, I remember the first time I saw a cheetah, I was probably like, I don't know, three years old, like actually on TV, like up close. Right. And I told my mom I wanted to be a cheetah. 
And so she was like, you can't be a cheetah, but you can run track. And so she put me and my brother in track at seven years old. And I just, I fell in love with it. I feel like some things you are born to do. And I think I was born to be a runner. And um, it took me, it took me far. It paid for my college. <laughs> that's, hey, that's, that's it. You know, get, get, uh, get so good at something that uh, somebody's either going to pay your way through school or pay you to do it. That's, that's so important for young exactly. kids to hear. Let's talk about your social media a little bit. Do you run it all by yourself? Do you have anybody help you? Because you have some great videos on there, training videos, stuff that people can do at home. I saw some of your quarantine uh, workout videos, stuff like that, but <laughs> I'm getting sore from watching these videos. That's how I used to work out. And I'm, you know, now I'm just running around chasing my kids. So that's the only <laughs> workout I need. <laughs> um, but Talk about your social media and how you've used that to your advantage as, as such a big platform that's grown so quickly. Man, Instagram. Well, first of all, yes, I, I do run my Instagram uh, on my own. That's the only thing that I get to still, you know, kind of keep to myself. Um, sure. I'm very, like, protective of it because literally that has created this. Everything that I do, all the opportunities, um, all of it comes from social media. I built my platform when I was actually in college. Um, I got on Instagram late, and the only reason I even got on Instagram was because my friend had told me that she could get more followers than me, and I'm, I'm uh, competitive, and I was I was like stuck on. I Facebook thought you were gonna too. say I, I got on Instagram to spy on my boyfriend or something. Okay, oh, go ahead, go ahead. you know that too. That's enough. <laughs> yeah, um, see, that's but, no, <laughs> but no, so like, long story short, um, I got on there. I was stuck on Facebook for a while, um, and I remember I just started posting my track and field workouts, you know, in college, and people liked it a lot. And I started to get some attention. Um, people started noticing, like, my stomach. Like, I have, a, I guess, a ripped stomach for a girl. I don't know, whatever. What do you mean um, you guess? You're the, what does it say, the queen of <laughs> queen abs? Of or <laughs> what's your, yeah. Yeah, Come queen on. of abs. <laughs> Let them know. Let them know. I'm just saying. Don't I'm just shy. saying. <laughs> and so that started to, like, I, I had videos, like, go viral. I had celebrities, like, repost my stuff. And that kind of like started my social media, um, you know, journey and literally what made me get like start taking it seriously because I was in college. I was a broke college student. Of course, we all were trying to find ways to make money. Um, yeah. And I remember this one girl, she was always reposting like products and this and that. And I was like, hey, do you get paid to do this? And she was like, yeah, like I get $100 to do this. And I was like, what? Okay, yeah, let me start college, trying to do what real. you're doing. Yeah, I was like, that's a lot of money. <laughs> and so she was like, she kind of gave me the game. And um, I remember the first sponsorship I got was from a, a t-shirt company in Hawaii. They sent me a free shirt. Um, and then from then on, like, I was like, yeah, this is, a, this is going to be my life. And that's cool. 2020, I'm still doing it. <laughs> okay, where did the love of sneakers come from? And how did you get to your own shoe company i mean this is i was so blown away by this i think this is so interesting for people tell us about your shoe company and and where the love of sneakers came from yeah so um i was and i still am i'm a i'm a tomboy um so like but i'm like also no very girly. not you <laughs> <laughs> you know i'm like the best of both worlds tomboy and girly um but no like i i just remember like always wanting to have all of these exclusive jordans when i was young you know, that was definitely the craze. It still is a craze, I guess. Um, and I remember there were times where I couldn't get them, you know, that we just didn't have the money or whatever it may have been. And, um, you know, I always told myself, like, one day I'm going to have my own sneaker. I didn't know when, um, but I told myself, like, one day that I'm going to have that. And um, be being an influencer, um, I attracted a company, another company that wanted to make me a signature line under their brand. And I was like, why not? And I remember the the graphic designer, he um he actually mocked up, you know, what I had explained to him that you know that I wanted. I told him I wanted something mm -hmm. that was like it was a sock shoe, very similar to like right. a Balenciaga sock shoe, but you know, athletic and I wanted it to stand out. I wanted it to be loud. And yep. um I remember he made like the first sketch and I was like, Oh my god, this is like this is spot on. So I posted it on my Instagram and it went crazy. Everybody wanted that shoe like immediately, yeah. even though it was just a thought at the time. And so next thing I know, we're like, okay, let's talk about an uh, actual line. So let's have more than one shoe. And so he started making up all these different colors, these designs and everything. I posted that again and it went even crazier. And so then my mom came in, who's also my manager. She was like, you know what? I think it's time to really think about something bigger. What if we did like a shoe company? And I was like, uh, mom, what? 
first of all, we have to go against Nike, Adidas, all these really, yeah. really big, you know, brands. I don't think that's possible. And she was like, I think you can do it. You have the support. You have the following. It took me a while to finally say yes. But in my mind, I was like, okay, if I do this, if I solidify this, this is going to solidify, you know, generational wealth. My future children will be set. Their kids will be set. And I just said, okay, I'm going to take this leap. It was a two-year process. It was a lot of ups and downs. It was times I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. But I, I, I stuck with it, and we're here now. <laughs> that is incredible. They're very loud. They're beautiful-looking sneakers. Thank you. I think you guys nailed it, and credit to your mom, too, for, for pushing you through that. Sometimes you need a friend or a parent or somebody to kind of get you over the hump at times, and uh, for her to have that awareness and foresight about mm -hmm. that niche market, I think you guys can blow this thing out of the water. That's really, really interesting and very cool story. If you could pick just one celebrity female, either an athlete, influencer, somebody like that, to rock your sneakers and give you a shout out on their Instagram and social media, who would you pick? I would probably pick Kim Kardashian just because she's like literally one of the biggest influencers in the world. Yeah. And she's great at branding. That's a great um, so business decision. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So I would definitely pick Kim. <laughs> well, Kim K, you're going to get a free pair of sneakers like she needs them. I'm sure she gets stuff all the time. But right. there are certain athletes, famous athletes who are on record, Charles Barkley, for example, basically saying like, I'm not a role model. Don't do exactly what I do. That works for me, but might not work for you. How do you see yourself and your influence on young women aspiring to their dreams, uh, reaching for their dreams and goals uh, in whether it's with football or, or other passions? How do you view yourself and your platform? I think I made a decision um, a long time ago um, that I was going to try to be a role model to young girls who might not have that. Being on this journey that I've been on for a while, like speaking to children, I've seen and heard a lot of just like devastating things that these kids are going through. And I just felt like I needed to kind of step up, you know, and use my platform and, and things like that to really show these kids that, first of all, it, you know, anything is possible. Um, secondly, that you don't have to go out here and do things that are degrading or, you know, image, you know, damaging to your image or whatever to reach, you know, a level of success. The main thing is I just wanted to show them that success is attainable. You know, no matter how you look, no matter what your gender is, no matter where you come from, no matter how big your dream is, it's attainable. Because I feel like we try to tell kids that uh, the sky is the limit, but I feel like there is no limit. There, there, the sky, there's, there, there's, you know, there's things past, you know, past the sky, I guess, um, <laughs> going to space. So like no, for I'm me, I, I just it, wanted I to, uh, yeah, I feel like I missed that completely. But I, I just <laughs> wanted to show them that it is possible. And I felt like, you know, the, the moment that I really started taking my platform seriously um, and the moment that I started turning, you know, my, my brand into like a, um, I guess, a, a business and, you know, actually using my voice to uh, try to promote change and things like that. That's when I decided that I was going to be a role model. It's not always easy. I'm definitely not perfect. I tell people that all the time, like, you know, I'm 28 years old, you know, I'm still young, you know, sometimes I don't make the best decisions, uh, but, you know, I try my best to show them that you can always come back to whatever path you're, you know, you're, you're on and, you know, you just have to have a lot of perseverance and determination to get to what you want in life. And I feel like I've, I've done a decent job of, of showing kids that. Don't sell yourself short. You're doing a great job, not a decent job. You're doing a great job. Tell me about, uh, I saw on your Instagram, I did a little uh, Instagram dive, a deep Instagram dive. So not trying to get too creepy or anything, but you're, uh, you have a feather tattoo and um, it says Luke 137. What's Luke 137? What does it mean to you and why the feather? So with the feather, um, it, it was actually something that I got, um, you know, when I was in college and it was just kind of like a symbol of like all of my friends because all of my friends, we end up getting like tattoos that kind of matched. Um, I got one here. My other friend got one on her shoulder and then my other friend got one on her waist. And it was just kind of just showing like our pact, you know, as far as our, our friendship and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a very spiritual person. So getting that verse, it, it means everything to me because it just kind of shows kind of like why I do what I do. And just it, it, to be honest with you, when I look at that, it, it reminds me to stay grounded. And I think sometimes we all need something, a reminder to show us and tell us that, OK, you know, yes, you are being successful in, in whatever you know realm you're being successful in but always remember where your blessings are coming from just stay mm -hmm. grounded and for me that's that's what it means luke 137 
uh, the word of God will never fail or God's word will never fail. So mm -hmm. that's that's wonderful. I love that um, that you promote that. I also heard what you said reminded me of a, a pastor I heard one time. He said um, that sometimes we can get uh, blinded by the blessings and forget about the blesser, the person yes. giving the blessings, yes. right? So mm -hmm. I, it, it, you, you nailed it. And that's, uh, that's a wonderful thing to hear. I think that's great for young kids to hear as well. Tell me about your uh, new partnership with East Bay and the new Conquer uh, campaign that they're running. I am a part of Conquer um, and pretty much what it what it represents, at least for me, is just showing um, the world that women are here to leave their mark, um, no matter what it is they're doing, like playing football. I know that is a, <laughs> it's still like a, a, a very big, I'm not gonna say um, issue for some people, but I do know there are people that don't like to see women on the football field. Like I've get, gotten DMs saying that I need to stay in the kitchen and things like that. And I'm Terrible. like, no, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going for that. But to me, just, it's just showing that women are out here breaking barriers, leaving our marks. Um, you know, there's so many women doing amazing things now in the sports world. You know, there's coaches, there's refs, there's all types of things. we got women playing football in college now. So it's like, I just feel like this is just really kind of like a, a platform and, and a, a campaign to kind of give us a voice because a lot of us don't have a voice, um, especially female athletes. Like, we are still fighting to be heard, to be seen, to be respected. And I feel like this campaign is really just giving us our, our flowers that I feel like a lot of female athletes are, are old. And um, I'm just excited that, you know, they, they chose me to be one of the people to kind of help pioneer this. And, you know, um, I'm excited about just the change that I'm, I'm currently seeing, because I know years, probably years ago, women never thought that we would have a freaking WFLA, you know, women right. basketball players are now getting, you know, paid enough to actually survive. And, you know, the soccer team is getting what they deserve and things like that. So it, we are slowly rising. So I think this campaign is just showing, you know, the world that we are here and we are going to continue to break barriers. Wow, that's very inspiring. I love that. Uh, this has been awesome for us. Thank you again for taking the time. Santia Deck, you're uh, a catalyst for women's change in sports. Uh, we love we love the role model you are and continue to be for these young women. Good luck with the shoe line. Good luck this season uh, with the WFLA. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. We just heard from Santia Deck. Hope you enjoyed that one and get ready for Dr. Jen Welter. We're really excited for this person on this special segment of Fourth and Forever. I'm Mark Sanchez, and I am joined by Dr. Jen Welter. Hold on, before we bring you in, Jen, uh, the first female coach in the NFL is a linebackers coach for the Arizona Cardinals. In 2015, you were there through training camp. Um, we want to hear all about your success around the globe with football, women's football, pro football. Thank you so much for being on the show. Hey, you know, you know who you call, I'm gonna be here. <laughs> that's right. Right, I mean, that's, that, that's what we do. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Where did your love for football come from? I think growing up in Vero Beach, Florida, where it was like a way of life, right? That sure. was the biggest thing. Florida football. Yeah, and really, uh, the whole town shuts down, everybody goes. Yeah. And I remember thinking that they looked like real life superheroes, <laughs> right? Like it was yeah. like the brightest lights as a little kid. Yeah. And I was like, and they just look like superheroes. And I wanted to be one. And it didn't occur to me at that time that it was just something that girls didn't do. Right, right. So I loved it like everybody else. Mm -hmm. There's actually an infamous Halloween that my mom and I fought over one time where I dressed up like a football player. <laughs> but the story is that she dressed me up as a princess. Nice. And as soon as I got to my, my guy friend's house, Home. I switched into the football <laughs> uniform, although I definitely did not really understand eye black at that time yeah. because I fully just gave myself black eyes. Nice. Yeah, so I was just a tough football player. I was just a football player. I really did like the have John the black Randall. eyes. Oh, nice. yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely John Randall. Very good. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, then you play rugby in college. Mm -hmm. uh, you brought up a good point before we went on air, but this rugby-style tackling nowadays has gotten an awful lot of coverage. Talk to me about playing rugby in college, how close it is to football, and now this transition that football's making from these helmet-to-helmet -helmet contacts to rugby-style tackling. I always credit my football success with my rugby roots, right? Like, or I guess it's backwards, right? Yeah. My, um, to my rugby roots because, you know, you learn how to tackle with no pads and no helmet. So, right. you know, I, I like to keep this intact, <laughs> which Smart. means you don't Smart. lead with it, right? right? And it's hips wrap and drop. And I always said, you know, you kind of want their hips to be like a pillow, like a little baby, yeah. right? So that you land on top. 
And so when I played rugby at BC, it was the closest I had ever been to being able to play football. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know rugby growing up, but I saw it and I was like, oh, I'm doing this. Right, Very so good. I was instantly in love. Yeah. And ended up playing for all four years at BC, got recruited to the U23 team at, at which they, time they realized that I was, you know, five foot two, a hundred and whatever. And I was a prop in rugby, so that's the front line of the scrum. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So literally um, half the size of everybody I was going up against. But it really taught me invaluable lessons, right? Angle of pursuit, tackling and leverage yeah. and how to use getting underneath somebody um, to be able to beat them. Right. So fell in love with rugby, then got an opportunity to try out for a team called the Mass Mutiny. Nice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> mass Mutiny That's is like even better do. than the, uh, like the farm team baseball. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> the Mass Mutiny. Oh yeah, I mean, come on. So it was a mutiny <laughs> yeah. to even be playing, right? <laughs> of course. Um, and I made it and I was like, this is it, right? And it's funny though, because when I was first playing, they were like, oh, she can tackle anybody. But you know, you're not tackling right. right? They'd be like, you know, you need to put your face mask right in here. And I'm sure. like, yeah, I like my face. Yeah. So hips are up and drop, coach. Right, hips are up and drop. And, I, and so I would still do it. And then it's like the better you get, the more they kind of leave you alone, sure, right? Sure. They're like, we're not going to do this. And then all of a sudden, rugby style tackling comes into vogue and they're like, Hey, uh, <laughs> what was that lady saying before? Right, hey, can you help us do that? And even when I was coaching recently with the Atlanta Legends, Brad Childress, one of the things he really wanted me to work on is he was like, you're a tackling specialist yeah. and you should be teaching all of these guys different stuff. So That's it's, pretty cool. it's been fun to see it. And it was really good street cred when I was the head coach of the Australian women's national team. So, um, you know, over there, gridiron, which they call football, yeah. is kind of the underdog sport. Sure, like they sure, have five codes over there, yeah. right? They're like, it's kind of the, sure. you're really playing that. And when I would tell them I played, you know, rugby and that I was a prop, they were like, All okay. right, respect. All right, so we'll take <laughs> she it. She checks the box. Yeah, okay. they, they, were, they were then good. I was like, That's I fair. don't need pads to tackle you, so let's just be <laughs> let's really clear. Let's go. Let's just be really clear. That's good. And then in, uh, in 2010, you played in the championship, right? Is that right? In 2010 was the first um, the first women's world championship, yeah. International level yeah. game. That had to feel amazing. Um, as a pioneer for women in the sport of football, take me through your emotions in a game like that. Um, not just, you know, the actual X's and O's of the game uh, or the scheme going into it, but on a bigger scope, yeah. how that felt. Even getting the first call was crazy, right? right? So it's like, congratulations, Jen Welter. You're one of the best 45 players in the USA, and we would argue the world. And you're gonna get to prove that. That's gotta feel good. Yeah, but then yeah. the next part of it is the truth of women in sports. Like, now yeah. here's what you're gonna have to do. No doubt. Uh, you're gonna so, have to take a month off work, and mountain. you're gonna have to cut a, a check for $3,000. Holy mackerel. Because, you know, it is still the reality that women have to pay to play football. Right. No matter how good you are, no matter how much you love it. Yeah. Obviously, like, I was among the best in the world. Um, but we all did it. We didn't think about it any other way, and our teammates really chipped in, helped us fundraise, do everything, and um, you know, there's no way I wasn't gonna do it, right? Because right? when I started playing football, that wasn't even a possibility. So to see that door open was crazy. It's really cool. Then we have camp in Round Rock, Texas, oh, yeah. in June. Oh, it's cooking. <laughs> okay, our field, we called it the rock, because yeah. it was so hard that you couldn't even wear cleats on it, because you know they would be like skates, right? Like they didn't even dig into the dirt. Yeah. We had three a days, not two oh. a days, right? And not oh. this like walk through slash, yeah. you know, walk through practice the like they CBA, have in the, yeah, yeah not, not the CBA <laughs> stuff, we were, Three a days with a roster of forty-five. Holy moly! Right, and no subs, yeah. and even into the nationals. So it was the most intense football experience, and it was the first time in my life that I only had one job, wow. that I just got to focus on football. Oh, that's cool! And it was like, wow, how how amazing! And so we come together, and you'll get this: we had no tape on anyone because nobody knew what these teams at the world level would look like. Of course, of course. So you have to prepare for everything. And I just remember, because there were like rumors of Team Germany, right? And that they'd been playing football over there for like 20 years and oh, the wow. women's team is giant. Like, 
we're watching like the Rocky movie. Like he's not a machine, Rocky, because <laughs> our poor coaches like didn't have you know, they didn't have any tape to give us. Great motivation, right? coach. So, love. you know, we get over there, and we had to play three games in a week. Holy cow! Okay, teams are talking about short weeks in prep now. We had like a game, a day off, a game, and then it was like two days where it alternated, right, where it was longer break, and then we had to play the championship. And we played the championship against Team Canada. Wow. And I remember just looking around and thinking, this has to change everything. Yeah. It is, we're Team USA in America's game. Like, this has to be the moment that changes everything. And it's so it's so surreal because you know we we hear the national anthem all the time yeah but it's not our anthem and then someone else's yeah right i remember the good first point. time i heard like oh my gosh they have a different anthem like on that yeah. level of just yeah. the pride of being able to go to stockholm sweden and play american football and those women i you know people talk about a league of their own they have nothing on on that team USA, wow. right? It 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 was the best football team I've ever seen. Hmm. We beat over three games. We beat the world, two hundred and one to zero <laughs> in twenty ten. So we gave the yeah the two hundred and one in twenty ten. We it. gave and as we said, we gave the world two hundred and one reasons to hate us. <laughs> um, and being a defensive player. Um, pitching shutouts all three games was huge. And I had an opportunity, me and another player led Team USA in tackles. Um, I had her big, I had a bigger sack for a loss than she did, so I'm gonna be competitive. <laughs> but everything else, numbers on the line was dead, dead across the board. And we were both on the all world all-star team. Nice. Right? And you leave that and you just go, wow. What a feeling. You know? so and cool. and what an red, white, and blue. And we got a, a gold medal that I think the chocolate over there, which was really good, was probably worth more um, <laughs> than the gold-esque medals we got, but that doesn't matter, right? Like, it, it really is. That the, wasn't uh, the point. It yeah. is not the point, but. That's cool. Yeah. Um, after your playing days, you start coaching. How did you end up with the Arizona Cardinals <laughs> in 2015 in the NFL, first female coach? One, incredible accomplishment, and then two, what was that experience like? How'd you get there, and what'd you learn from it? So I got into men's tackle football in the most painful way possible. Uh-oh. I actually played. Okay. So I was the first woman to play running back in men's pro football. Whoa. Um, and I played with the Texas Revolution for a season. Okay. So not just a game, not just a play. I took hits from them every day. And that's and a what? Like 12-game season, 10-game season, something like that? That's a good question. I I don't remember that, but um, and it was indoor, so there's no running out oh, of bounds. Well, yeah, it was not something I'd ever set out to do. Um, I was kind of more like calling BS on bad behavior. They wanted me to go through a day of training camp with their guys. And, That's how it started. Yeah, and I was like, oh, so you want me to like come out and maybe like smile for the camera, run some ladder drills, you know, right, do that right, kind right, of stuff? Right, right. And they were like, yeah, and I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, I just won my second gold medal. It's a really big insult to me as an athlete, yeah. right? And um, if I was any one of your guys on your team, I would absolutely hate it. You want to do anything with me and your football team, I either do every day, everything they do, step for step, hit for hit for all the training camp, or I do nothing at all. And the second those words came out of my mouth, I was like, yeah, Welter, you <laughs> might have just gotten yourself killed, right? Like, you're five, what are you thinking? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it caught the coach's, attention because sure. up until that moment he was really mad about this wow. right like he was like trying not to make eye contact like yeah. if I don't make eye contact she'll maybe go away right Doesn't like exist. this isn't real <laughs> um and so it got real then and I ended up not only going through all of training camp but you know being with the team and in the process just really learned how to be a great teammate with the guys yeah um they looked out for me taught me a lot we came together in a way that most people didn't expect. Yeah. It was a point of pride for them. Um, and I was on practice squad for a lot of it. And you know, naturally I'm, I'm a defense player, I'm not a running back. That was also a setup to get me killed, wow. for sure. Cause yeah. you know. Let everybody take their shot. Alex. Well, yeah, I mean, and if you had one play that you wouldn't call for a five foot two, 130 pound running back, what, what might that Probably play be? Probably not power. Probably not, maybe not a dive. Yeah. 
Um, how about not a dive up the middle three times in a row? Love it. How about not that, right? <laughs> so really the fact that I just kept going yeah. and they knew they would have to cut me or kill me, but I wasn't quitting, um, was where I was earned the respect to the guys. And I would see stuff, right? Like, and I'd be like, hey, they're trying to do this, right? They're trying to get you to overcommit. Next time they're gonna boot out the backside, like yeah. take a good angle up field. And they'd laugh, they'd be like, oh my gosh, she's like our little coach on the sidelines. Nice. Right? So, so that's how it started. It is. And I never thought of it officially, but then we had former Dallas Cowboy Wendell Davis came in um, as a new head coach the following season. He saw how the guys responded to me mm -hmm. and grilled me on football, all this stuff. And the next day he was like, you have to coach my football team. Nice. And I was like, no. So what do you mean? I said, no, no, girls don't coach football. I've never coached before. I'm not doing that. And he said, not a lot of guys are going to give you this opportunity. You're taking this job. Yeah. And I said, nope. I hung up on him, and the next day he called me back and told me about myself. <laughs> he said, do you remember how I told you not a lot of guys were going to give you this opportunity you were taking this job? I said, yeah. He said, good. I took it for you. You're <laughs> coaching for me. And by the way, you can't quit. Otherwise, the entire narrative surrounding women coaching and men's pro football will be, we had a girl wow. once, and she quit. And I was like, you Couldn't let that what? happen? No, couldn't let that happen. Yeah. Couldn't quit. We don't quit. Okay. I might not have stepped up into that challenge, but I lovingly say, like, I'm so glad he drop kicked me to success sure. and saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. The Cardinals was a little different. Uh, when Sarah Thomas got hired as the first full-time ref in NFL history, yeah, yeah. a reporter asked Bruce Arians if he could ever see a female coaching in the NFL. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that's how, the, okay, keep going. Yeah. Take so, me down the road. Yeah, so the road is, you know, and they obviously asked Bruce because – He's not one of those coaches who won't say anything. He's not the coach that's like, oh, yeah, the team with the most points will win the game. He's yeah. like, he'll he's tell you. something to say. Yeah, yeah just like, ask Tom Brady. Yeah, exactly. That's why I was like, he'll tell you and tell you a lot, sure. maybe more than you want to know. Um, but he said, the second a woman proves that she can make these guys better, she'll be hired. So I talked to my head coach about it, and he was like, well, we should call Bruce. Can you get me his number? Don't you have, like, a black Decks, book or yeah. something, like – what, why am I getting his number? Like, come on. Like, isn't there a little little NFL buddy system or something? Sure, sure. Um, but he kind of challenged me. And so I went on the Arizona Cardinals website. I started looking around to see if there was a number. So I called him. And I called on behalf of my head coach and said, you know, my head coach wanted to talk to their head coach about the fact that he had said a female coach. And, you know, so I called the Cardinals on behalf of myself. They didn't know it. Didn't know. You know, they didn't know it was None me calling on beside of myself. But hey, we all have a hustle, right? That's right. Um, and ended up connecting with Bruce's assistant, Wes. He said, "I think BA would really want to take this call." And but it was right before the draft, so uh, it was like we're a little busy. You know, it's not like draft day. Contrary to what you people think, there is no life yeah, no outside doubt. of there's there's no not doubt. funerals on the fifty yard line and stuff like that. There's there's no extra calls. Um, so I gave him his number, and I pretty much thought I had gotten blown off, but I was really proud of myself for, like, calling an NFL team, right? Yeah. The closest I'd ever been to an NFL team at that point was, like, the nosebleed section. Sure, so sure. then about two weeks later, I walk into practice, and I get, well, you'll never guess who I talked to yesterday. It was Bruce Arians, and he said, tell me about this girl. And so, you know, he had really dug into my playing career. Did I love the game? Um did the guys listen? That was one of the biggest things. Like, yeah. Did they listen? Did they respect her? He loved the fact that I had a PhD um, and a master's in sports psychology. Um, and he eventually invited me out to training camp. Nice. Um, and then, you know, at the end of it, um, I impressed him and he said, you know, I don't know yet that I can make this happen. I have to get a whole lot of yeses. But I want you to know it was, it's in my heart to try. Wow. So it was literally just me and him. It was not like I was banging down every door. Um, Bruce Arians really made that happen. Um, and in terms of the players, like, it was better than I could have ever imagined. I mean, I already had a, relationships with, like, I say my NFL big brothers throughout yeah. my career who would come and watch me play and do this, don't do this, talk to this person, you know, kind of um, like I was like their kid sister. Yeah. Um, and I'd always listened, um, but 
with the guys, it was so much that they were like, man, coach, we thought like it was hard for us to get here, but for you, yeah, like oh, yeah. this is ridiculous. And they were so proud to be a part of changing something within the NFL culture. No doubt. Um, and it's a rigid really culture. Took, I yeah. mean, that's not easy to break through that way. No, it's not. Wow. And they took a whole lot of pride in being the guys who did that. And I think, you know, that's why we have such good relationships to this day is because, you know, something that it really was the first and the whole world was watching, I think, to see if I would face plant. Of course. But still, I mean, you proved people wrong your whole life. And that was just another example for you. Um, then you using that momentum and nowadays this becoming this big wave and you're a big part of that wave of females in sports, especially breaking through in sports that they haven't been a part of like football. Um, tell us what you're doing with East Bay and the Conquer movement, C-O-N-Q-H-E-R. It's so special to see stories of women breaking through um, and sports are such a great way to do it, no right? Doubt. Because you can see people win and be champions in something that plays out publicly, which I think strengthens strengthens people in their own lives as no well, no right? No like you see her winning, and you're like, okay, I might have this, right? And it opens it opens minds and opens yeah. doors. People feel a part of it. Yeah. That's right. And sports, you know, one of the things that I speak on often is in sports media, about four percent of the coverage goes to women in sports. Mm. Then you look at participation for young girls. And it's like, we want them to aspire to play sports and we know how good it is for their confidence and their life trajectory. Right. And yet, they don't they're see not, it. that's right. They don't, they don't have the posters, they don't have as many of the role models. So um, how powerful to have, you know, the Conquer campaign in East Bay dedicated to increasing the storytelling yeah. and the access to powerful women you know, in the trenches doing the right things and breaking through so that, you know, hopefully we will continue to keep building, right? And the next generation will be raised believing that they can and should continue to build on that momentum. Yeah. Um, and that's really the goal. That is awesome. Um, you have a master's in sports psychology, a doctorate in psychology. Um, I wrote talk my... About I wrote my dissertation on the NFL's use of the Wonderlick in player selection. Too, no way. way. Yeah. And your thumbs up Wonderlick or thumbs down? That's a stupid test. <laughs> Wait, look. Look, I mean, it is. And, and the stats bear it out. They wouldn't let me put that in the dissertation, though. I'm just saying they won't let that. But you have to be uh, very intelligent to be great, right? right? No, doubt, no doubt. Especially the But there's the different kinds position. of intelligence. That's right. And it doesn't tap into that intelligence. Yeah. I played with players and I won't name players, yep. but you're like, I don't understand how this guy in the real world doesn't walk out in the street and get hit by a bus. Like right. he can't maybe put a sentence together. He can't do this or that, but this, you put this guy on the field and you're just blown away with his football IQ, his spatial awareness, like yep. understanding how the game works. Um, there's something to that and you can't really write that down. Right. right? And, and expertise theory says that basically intelligence is only predictive of initial uptake, mm -hmm. right? So right, how like, quickly you can learn something, right, yeah. So, and then the more you do it, right? Like that first phase, I always say, just picture a kid bouncing a basketball, right? right? Like when they first do it, it's like the basketball is their whole world, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? But once they practice, that part becomes automated and smooth to the point that they don't have to think about it anymore, right? right. right? So intelligence, especially IQ intelligence, right. which is what they're talking about, isn't predictive of expertise once you're through kind of that initial phase. Right. So most experts, which you go to like theory of 10,000 hours, yeah. they're well past where that would be predictive. So why are we going back to yeah. something like that? And there is precisely zero research that supports its use, but it was basically grandfathered in, blame the Cowboys who used to be not America's team. This is gonna be an interesting one, but they used to be known as America's analytics team. Oh, wow. So that's where the nickname came from. Huh. Because they were the first ones to really put, under the Landry era, they were the first ones to really put analytics to football and scouting. And they were doing so well that everybody else just said, we're going to do what right. they do. Such a copycat league. Yeah, yep. of course. Huh. So that's how it got uh, grandfathered in when the, you know, draft or when the combine started in 1982. 
Very cool. Yeah. Um, where can, where can um, well, I wanted to ask if there was yeah. something you would say to young women aspiring to um, break through the way you did, whether it's football or anything else. Um, what, what's your, you know, if you could tell them one thing, what would it be? You know, I say, let your game speak. Mm. Let your game speak louder than your gender, louder than your haters, louder than your detractors, louder than all of those things. Because when you're good, someone will want you. No doubt. They don't owe you a spot just because you're a girl. It's not, it's not enough to just show up while female and say, you have to take me because of this, right, right. right? I want you to know your skills are good. And guess what? If someone overlooks you because you're a female, give them whiplash with your ponytail. Cause they'll be like, <laughs> she's a girl? Like, as opposed to, oh yeah, we'll find a spot for you. And then it's like, sure. you know, so sure. you, you have to focus not on, you know, the gender or what you didn't get or any of those things, mm -hmm. but really dig in and be great at your craft and talent will eventually rise to the top, but keep fighting, keep grinding and develop relationships where people get an opportunity to see how good you are. That's right. Um, because that was the most important part of playing with the guys is that they didn't, you know, it was never, whether it was there in indoor or in, you know, with the Cardinals. It wasn't like, oh, we're looking for a girl and she might fit, you know, she might check our girl sure, box. Sure. It was like, we balled together, sure. right? And, you know, we were in the trenches and that's where we develop relationships that say, oh, I want this person around more or this person could be good for the organization. Even if we need to train them on X, Y, and Z, you know, you know their love, you know their passion, yeah. you know their skill. There's something there that adds to the... That's yeah. right. That's really cool. Um, having worked with men and women, uh, is it true that men are just more stubborn about learning some of these things when you try and develop the winning edge and, and talk about that mindset, like a winning mindset? Who have you found it easier to work with? I mean, has it? have you noticed any differences or it's just, hey, the ones who want to win, want to win, and that's the way it is? No, there's definite differences. Um, with With women, and it might just be specific to football because they haven't a lot of them haven't had the lifelong, you know, journey to have gotten to play so young. Sure, sure. Um, so you might, it might be also age because they want to know the why. Uh, right? Okay. They want to know, and that, that, that it's in yeah. a lot of areas for women, <laughs> right? Like they'll Makes do sense. it, but it want, they want it to make sense, yeah, right? Like yeah. if I'm doing this drill, tell me why. Tell me how it translates. <laughs> tell me how I'm going to apply it. So you have to get women with the story surrounding what's going on. Yeah, they okay. want the context. They want the why. <laughs> For guys, it's just some sort of time, some sort of score, goal, or competitive well, you know, atmosphere. It's like, okay. Yeah. like and Why am and, I doing this? Not really sure, but go do it. Yes, sir. <laughs> right. Unless you lost credibility. Right. Of course. Of right. Course. If you lost anything, then, yeah. then you need over it. They want to get better. Sure. Right. But if you if I tell you like standing on your big toe might make you better, <laughs> right? They don't they don't have to hear that backstory. Sure. And part of it is the fluidity because they've been doing it for so long and it's probably like, oh man, yeah, you're right. But for them, what I found is that the relationship and trust yeah. is foundational. Like trust and love with guys is huge because if they know that I'm always gonna give you my best, yeah. right? They'll do it. They'll do anything for you. Right, and also that I'm not gonna sell them out the second something doesn't go right. right. Like, they know I would never give them anything less than that, and if something goes wrong, like, I'm gonna say, hey, that was me, right? Like, I, I told them to go under, right? Like, right. that's, you know, and a bad call wasn't with bad intention. Sure. We can get past it, yeah. right? But for Stick them, and, and still, like, it's funny, because I was talking to one of my players um, on my way over here, right? A lot of the guys would say like, man, just, just the relationship was different. Cause I would say my job is to help you. Yeah. Right. Like whether it's, you know, I need to get you to get to heel depth, squeeze this line slants down, you know, maintain outside, go to the quarterback go ahead, or coach. Go right? ahead. like these, that, that gets really easy when, you know, I'm like, Hey, um, you don't usually miss that play today. Are you all right? Because they know you're watching, they know you care. That's right. Yeah. And even if they tell you nothing, the fact that you didn't just say, oh, that was a bonehead, I can't believe you didn't yeah. do that. It was like, hey, what's up? You all right? Yeah. 
because their mind guys was don't probably, do that. <laughs> no, no, they don't. That's really and, funny. You know, but such that, a unique perspective. That's cool. But that was, I think, often the biggest difference maker that the guys weren't used to, and they responded to so well. Yeah. Be like, man, coach, how'd you see that? I'd be like, I got you. Yeah. Like, just tell me when you need a minute. If that's you need a minute, I got you. Because if your mind's somewhere else, and that's that's so many things in performance, right? If your mind's somebody else, you're not here. So if I'm gonna help you here, I need, I need to here. bring you fully yeah. here. Got it. Um, and so that was kind of one of the things with them. With the women, um, and especially when I had guy coaches, because um, like when I was the head coach of the Australian team, um, I had a lot of guys on my staff. I was probably the tougher one on them at points. Mm -hmm. And the guys got to be like the nice Good ones. Good cup, bad right? cup kind like of thing, it yeah. was, you know, it was interesting, but they were looking at me as like, I want to do what she did and how to get there. Yeah. Um, and they had a an image of me as like having kind of been superhuman after having played with the guys. And I actually had to go in and make every one of them find my kryptonite. Yeah. Because basically they'd be like, oh, but you can do that because you're Jen Welter. And they were talking themselves out of it. Right, right, right. Um, which I was like, wow, what, what made me a great player has now made me a liability as a leader, <laughs> right? Yeah, which which the guys cool. wouldn't want that. They'd, right. they'd want me to be ice cold, right? They don't want to see anything ever be wrong with me. Right. Um, and so that was, those were some of the differences. That's cool. That's yeah. a really unique perspective. Um, having gone through some of your ups and downs along your journey, what would you, um, if you could go back and tell your younger self something, what would you say? Just fail forward, right? Like, and don't worry about it. Don't take it so seriously. Yeah. Right. I think for me, I'm so competitive that I'm also competitive with myself. Of course. And your own toughest critic, yeah, that kind of thing. Always. Yeah. And so it would be like, you know, just focus on being as good as you possibly can and let go of the things that you don't do right, right? Like have a short sure. memory, no doubt. right? Like those of us on defense, have a short memory, take the lesson and just go forward because it's not the end. Yep. And I think too often we think of like one game or one play or, you know, one opportunity that didn't come through as being an end and yet life isn't ending there. So if you, right. anytime you stay there, um, it's time that you can't be moving forward. Um, and to really like rejoice in the people and the moments along the way, yeah. right? Really make sure to embrace and celebrate these crazy things. And I think I would have said, take a lot more pictures. <laughs> well, like there's so, so like many my, things from my journey that I try to explain to people. My mom and dad are people. like that all the time. Well, you gotta I, write stuff down. You gotta remember all yeah, this. Yeah, like, and I have a good, I have a, a story-based memory. Yeah. Right, like you're, I go. You're a great storyteller. Well, I go back there. Yeah. Right, so it's of course it's like, in your mind, and then you just narrate the that's picture, right. the moving picture. Yeah. And so if if I had more pictures, I would probably be able to take you back. <laughs> like I want the low lights reel because it's not really the <laughs> highlight reel. Like people have seen like the highlight reel yeah, of, of my course, life. They're of they're pretty well documented because it was in the yeah, no you know, it was in the spotlight. But the low light reel of some of the hotels that I stayed at. <laughs> Like there was a hotel in Long Beach that we stayed at. There, Carol, that's my hometown now. That's look, where I was born. The LBC, and I, I couldn't tell you where it was. <laughs> Two one three. Look, we walked in, and it was. <laughs> it, it didn't smell so good, so you didn't you didn't take your so suitcases you. all the way in. Okay. Yeah, it totally smacked me in the face, and so we just kind of like took our stuff out and went by the pool and. Eventually, there was a collection of, you know, a whole football team of women around the pool, which yeah. could be a little intimidating. Um, and we ended up getting chased out by the hotel manager because apparently that's where the prostitutes picked up their johns. Oh, no. And a football team of women was bad for business. <laughs> oh, no. So, You're like, in the local economy, Coach. But, you know, it's, it's those things. And, you know, we moved and it was, yeah. it was nothing permanent or whatever. But it's those things in the journey yep. that feel hard, yeah. and yet they make us who we are. No doubt. Right? Like, and so I wish I had, had done a better job of you know, capturing those hotels so that people could literally look at it and be like, oh, wow, okay. Because they think pro football, even, and that's why I say pro, fesh, pro 
as opposed to professional because we can't afford all those letters. I get it. I get it. Dang. If you had to put a pen down on paper and um, people could take away one thing from your your journey, um, you breaking down barriers, what, what would you want them to learn? You know, I was thinking about being the first the other day and so many people like glorify it, right? Like, this is a trailblazer. Yeah. Da, da, da. Like all trailblazer means is that you're the one who took all the branches to the face. Yeah. Right? Like the one it crazy is, enough to do it. That's right. And and it's it's not easy and it's not graceful. And at times you're like you're bloodied and battered and you have bad hair and you got scratches. And the next person gets to like skippity doo dah down the trail, like, yeah. oh, that's so pretty. Awesome. So just remember that that progress is painful. I know. And to do it, you're signing up for something like, you know, I know that there are doors that I've fought to open that I'm not, I'm not allowed to walk through. Right. And so there's, there's a real dichotomy. And yet, at the same time, that's what change needs, right? I've had people say, well, we don't, you know, we don't celebrate first. Well, no, you really should because it takes a first to get to be a second. Oh, yeah. And what's so powerful about it is not just the person who was there, right. right? I was the craziest one who happened to be in the right position and say yes, right? Um, but it's also the power that creates the ripple effects of a second and no a doubt. third no and doubt. a fourth. And then you get a little momentum. That's right. So and cool. it gives people permission to dream, Yeah. right? I didn't have that, like I said. And the reason I tell people that about coaching, that I turned it down, I was like, no, I can't do that, Right. right. is because at that time, there wasn't anybody I could look at and say, I'm gonna do what she's doing. But every time one of those barriers get broken, um, it becomes like the four minute mile, yeah. right? Like yeah. it was impossible until it wasn't. Until it wasn't. Very cool. Yeah. Wow, powerful, inspiring. Dr. Jen Welter, there she is. Like, share, subscribe, uh, at Mark underscore Sanchez, at Fourth and Forever, Instagram, Twitter, all that. You know where to go. Thanks again for having us and we'll see you soon.